So committee, we are looking at 155. And Amron, would you like to um, <coughs> give us um, any changes that have been made since the last time we looked at this? Yes, for the record, Amron Abergele, Legislative Council, you have two bill drafts posted on your webpage today. One is S-155 as introduced, and then you also have draft 1.1. So draft 1.1 is a strike all amendment to S-155. And these are some changes that have been discussed in committee as well as some additional requests uh, from the chair of the committee. So I have done this as a relatively clean copy because some of the language I changed was just removing language. I have put comments along the side so you can see where the language has been removed. Um, oh, so unless that's, anyone that's wants- That's why it's tiny. That is why it's tiny. <laughs> I apologize. I will send a, a second clean version also for that's you that okay. is bigger. <laughs> um, so unless anyone would like to have more detail, I was just going to move to the spots where I made changes. Does that I, sound? Yeah. I, that I think that that sounds okay. And then we'll when we once we go through them, then we'll take t the testimony on on what whatever parts people want to speak to. Okay. Uh, the first change is on page two. This is uh, I would say a significant change from the last version, which is to remove the DMV law enforcement officers. Um, from being transitioned as of July 1st, 2023. As you will see later in the bill, um, they are being added to the study at towards the end of the bill. So you'll see on page two, um, in terms of the agency of public safety structure in subdivision to the Department of Law Enforcement, which includes the division of the Vermont State Police, and then it is silent on any other divisions that will be added at later dates. Then moving down onto page four, you may recall from committee discussion about whether division directors would be exempt or classified. Uh, and DPS requested that there be some flexibility here. So I've added a line in here to note that <clears throat> these division directors could be in the classified service or they may be exempt. And the next change is all the way down on Page 12, there was a previous section three here that was the transfer of the Department of Motor Vehicles Enforcement Officers that has been removed and the remaining sections have been renumbered. Uh, in section six, which used to be section seven, I've revised the language to um, remove some of those portions that discussed DMV enforcement officers being within the agency of public safety. So I kept this section in just to make the change to the title for the commissioner. So it is commissioner of law enforcement rather than public safety. The next change is down on page scrolling. I think we're getting pretty close to the end now. Um, in the reporting section on page 26, section 19, creation of agency of public safety reports in subsection B, you'll see that the Department of Motor Vehicle Certified Law Enforcement Officers have been included now in the study that the Agency of Public Safety is required to do, um, reporting back on October 15th, 2023. And this is about the feasibility and advisability of transferring the operations of those officers. And then the next change is on page 27. This is an entirely new section, section 20. Unification of Animal Welfare and Related Public Safety Functions Report, subsection A, on or before January 15th, 2023, the Department of Public Safety, in consultation with the Agency of Agriculture and any other state agency, division, or department where domestic animal welfare functions reside, shall report to the House and Senate Committees on Government Operations with a plan to unify the domestic animal welfare and related public safety functions across state government. The report, which shall include draft legislation to enact the plan, shall focus on the intersection of existing domestic animal welfare functions and the role of the Department of Public Safety, and shall include, one, an inventory of all existing domestic animal welfare and related public safety functions across all agencies, including citations to existing statutes, Two, an inventory of all personnel with job descriptions responsible for carrying out the functions of the inventory required in subdivision one. 
I'm now moving on to page 28. Subdivision three, a recommended location and position in state government with responsibility for all state domestic animal welfare and related public safety functions, including enforcement. Four, a recommendation on whether to move all domestic animal welfare and related public safety functions to a single agency or to maintain a multi-agency approach to be coordinated by the position recommended in subdivision three. And lastly, five, a plan to ensure that domestic animals transported into the state from other jurisdictions meet health and safety standards and that the businesses that import domestic animals into the state are registered or licensed or both and meet health and safety standards. And lastly, subsection B, the department shall engage with the Animal Welfare Coalition consisting of the Animal Cruelty Investigative Advisory Board, the Vermont Humane Federation and the Animal Welfare Regulations Coalition as needed to comply with this section. Uh, this was added, and you may recall there was a conversation in, in committee at one point about um, that advisory board, which is currently part of the department or attached to the Department of Public Safety. And then I made some minor changes to the effective dates, not the date itself, but I had to. Uh, make updates to the section numbers after I renumbered. And those are all the changes. Okay, so uh, committee, what I'm gonna um, do, I think is uh, do it this way, ask, first of all, go through those changes that have been made and so that um, we, we can take comments on those changes um, and then we can deal with the bill as a whole instead of trying to take testimony on the bill as a whole before we um, look at the changes that Amron has made right now. Does that make sense to you so that we can decide? I mean, there are really two major changes in here. One is the DMV and one is, <coughs> Amron, did you put the DMV back into this study at the end with fish and wildlife is that that, yes. that is in there right yes okay so what i'm so that and the animal um section really are the the major changes here and so i'd like to make sure that we're okay with putting those in in that way before we get to general testimony and i will i see that um tony Fakos is with us and i will say that um one of the compelling reasons that made us um, do this is that the DMV was being moved and the others were being studied. And the concern was, what if they find out that um, it, this, they're not going to move anybody else and yet, and that DMV has already been moved. So we just thought it was, um, took, was, uh, was conservative to, um, put them in the study as well and at this point and so that there could be more discussion and more um, impact studies and that was the reason and the animal uh, welfare board came to us because they, the department of public safety already has the advisory board and and yet um, there are sections of animal welfare that are scattered throughout and um, this is again just a study to see where where it should live and how how those issues should live. So, does anybody have questions on those two issues and how and whether or not they should be in there? <coughs> no. The committee members, how about anybody else to, in in the way in the that's joining us here in the room? Tony, do you have any? Would you like to comment on that? I know this is a little contrary to the testimony we heard from you, but. Sure, uh, for the record, Director Tony Fakus, DMV. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. Uh, I just wanna say on behalf of DMV, we do sincerely appreciate all of the effort that you and this committee has put forward in trying to improve public safety here in Vermont as a whole. And, uh, you know, as I said in my last testimony, we'll be successful no matter where we end up. And we will always be a partner in looking at um, this and, and, uh, and the future. And we look forward to seeing where we all end up. But thank you. Great. Thank you. And, and then I would ask particularly, I guess, uh, Commissioner Sherling, if he, 
Mike, if you have any comments on the language around the animal um, study group. Uh, thank you. No, Madam Chair, there's been an extensive uh, email correspondence today, as you know, uh, trying to help Amber and Gordon Smith with the scope. And I think it's uh, in pretty good shape. Good. Thank you. There were a lot, as he said, there were a lot of emails around. Is it a companion animal? Is it a domestic animal? Is it an egg animal? What kind of an animal is it that we're looking at here? And I think um, Amarin has threaded that needle very well. So, yep. okay. So does anybody else have any um, comments on those two or should we assume that they're going to be in the bill? Okay. I think that we're going, the changes that you've made there, Amarin, in draft 1.1, are, are good and we will thank you, Tony Fakos. And um, I think that then what we'll do is jump to um, other, other testimony. And <coughs> we have a lot of people here and I do apologize if anybody got the impression that I didn't wanna have people testify. That is the farthest thing from um, the way I try to operate this committee and the way the committee itself um, views our responsibility. So we um, had not heard a lot from people um, about this issue. We did have some people testify before um, about a year ago, and this is an entirely new draft since then that um, was made partly in response to some of that testimony from many places. And then we did have some testimony um, around the community engagement, Office of Community Engagement. But with, with that, what I'm going to do is just call on people and you, you are free to, to say whatever you want in response to this bill and um, where you are and what you're issues might be with the bill. I will say before we start, and I'm not trying to limit your testimony at all, but I will say that this is a reorganization bill and it does not solve the other issues that of law enforcement that we're looking at. This is, we have um, worked a lot on law enforcement issues in this committee and in judiciary over the years and <clears throat> have made many, many, many changes. And currently more changes are being um, made as Heather Simons can attest to from the Criminal Justice Council and other places. So this really is about this bill. But with that said, I'm going to just um, try and uh, bring up my agenda here so I can see <laughs> uh, people's names, where we are, and um, and who's on the list. And I know that there are a ton of people's names on here, but um, <clears throat> these the way we do this is everybody who has been following the bill is um, re-invited, and that's why you see so many names like Mike Sherling and Chris Burkell and Heather Simons and um, on there repeatedly. But with that, I'm going to jump first to, um, well, I guess we, on this one, I don't think we've heard from Chief Pete on this bill, have we? I see your I'm, I'm skipping over all of the, um, for the time being, for right away, I'm skipping over all of the, the law enforcement people that we've heard from a number of times and jumping to those who we haven't heard from on this issue as much. And um, so Chief Pete, have I don't think we have heard from you on this. Were you interested in testifying on this? Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Um, I'm just here in the capacity to uh, to represent the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police and to answer any questions that um, uh, folks may have of me in that representation. Okay, great. Thank you. Then I think what we'll do is uh, the next person that I have on my list is 
Maya Schultz, but I don't see Maya. Yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll reach out to Mia. Um, Mia. And uh, Stefan's running a little bit late if he's on your list. That's okay, fine. well, he's, he's far down on the list, but so I'll just, we'll just jump over Mia for the time being. And the next person that I have on my list is um, Mark Hughes, but Mark sent a note earlier today that said he was not testifying on either of these bills today. Saw um, that. So, Aton, I believe you're on up. Oh. Wow. It's the banana <laughs> belt. How, how, it is indeed, yes. How are you doing with all that snow down there? How are the well, bananas? I, <laughs> I have to say I'm wondering where all that snow is, but I'm not oh. complaining. Are you oh. in Putney? I'm in Putney. You have yeah. a lot of snow. snow. I guess the south well, end of the village has more than the north end of the village. It may well be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Well, so would you like to join us? And, and again, as I said, <clears throat> um, feel free to, to comment on the bill in general, specific aspects of the bill. Um, so go ahead, please. Okay. Um, for the record, Eitan Nasred and Longo, I uh, am the co-director of Fair and Impartial Policing Community Affairs um, and also chair of the RDAP. Um, I really want to stay in my lane, which is to say, as far as this bill is concerned, I really would like to address um, really matters of fair and impartial policing as they might in fact pertain to an agency of public safety. Um, you know, I was listening to you, Madam Chair. I don't remember, I remember speaking about this at some point. I don't remember to whom, I don't remember when it was, but I do remember sort of pointing, saying to people that in my day-to-day -day life um, in the with the state police, I receive on the order of about three a week, um, requests, concerns, something from various people around the state about issues relating to fair and impartial policing. So these tend to be about people feeling that there had been some, um, what's the word, something, let's just say something wrong has happened regarding policing. And they write to me, um, most of the time I have been told they find me on the website for the state police and they write. Um, I am then in the somewhat unenviable position of having to tell them that my purview is the state police and no further. But what people are talking about are you know, all inconsistencies basically in law enforcement, in policing throughout the state, um, that the fair and impartial policing policy, notwithstanding, they're experiencing forms of treatment wherever they may be that they may not experience in other places. Um, my feeling about an agency, particularly when I read the earlier parts of this bill, have to do with the idea that the, the bill is concerned with standardization in many ways, with um, bringing things together. And I think clearly the fair and impartial policy as it stands at the moment is something in which there's enough room for interpretation that things fall through the cracks. Um, and that people of color in particular cannot expect the same kind of treatment in, I'm just picking places, don't anyone think I'm saying this, but in, all right, I'll, I'll be better than that. In town A and in town B and in town C, different things happen. Um, my feeling is that this move towards an agency may help alleviate some of that. Um, I am certainly, given my position, hopeful that that would be the case. Um, it's still not right that what goes on in A and what goes on in B and what goes on in C are very different. Um, and frequently, 
there are no backups in these places. Um, what I can tell people, and it doesn't go over very well, is, well, you can talk to the chair of the select board. Um, the problem with that is often in our small state, people are friends. Not that that's always a problem, but in, ca in cases like this, there may be a conflict of interest that comes up simply because it's a small place and people know one another. Um, so I, that's not a particularly workable solution for many people. It's not a satisfactory solution for many people. And I do think having an agency might get us around a lot of that. I've been giving that a lot of thought lately. So I think I'll just leave it there because you've got a lot of people in front of you. And I see Senator Ram Hinsdale's hand is up. Hello. Hi, Madam Chair, is it all right if I ask a question? Thank, yes, thank, please. Thanks, Aton. My, my deepest struggle with this bill doesn't contradict what you said. It's not, it's not what's in the bill, it's what's not in the bill. Um, mm -hmm. I think what you said still gives me concern that the idea that we just hope that this would lead to more transparency, a place where people can lodge complaints, where there is a standardized process for what they learn about the outcome, um, you know, where people can experience some sense of accountability. So I, I certainly, in my mind, an office of engagement just doesn't right a lot of the wrongs of unfair and mm -hmm. partial policing <laughs> that has happened in the past or that people are experiencing. And I wonder um, if you think there is something proactive that could be put in the bill that speaks to your work that could make sure it's cemented into the agency so that we're not just hoping for the best, but that this bill has something that gives people a sense there will be greater accountability, oversight, and transparency. I would say, and I, I need to think it through a lot more, but that one of the things that would be important is that, that the al already extant um, review of the policy that goes on, um, it's now supposed to be, I believe, every two years by the council, would be something that is also reviewed by this Office of Community Engagement um, from the, and if that that review would be advised by the feedback that the office is requiring. Um, and that that would be also on a fairly, I would say on a much more frequent basis, maybe an ongoing basis indeed, um, that, that it would not, that this office of community engagement would not only engage the stakeholders, but have a specific task regarding the fair and impartial policy that has to be completed. In so, so, it would, <laughs> yes, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead That's please. all. Go ahead. I was uh, just gonna talk it, about reporting out and I'm not sure how that would be. I would imagine that would be to the council. Um, and I think that would be appropriate, though I certainly don't wanna give the council more work than they already have. But in terms of just structures, and structural issues, I think that would be a place to go. That's a beginning of an answer for you, Senator. I have, I, you got me. <laughs> so I, given that, I wonder if um, an additional um, charge in the, in the section on community engagement could be that they are charged with developing a policy that requires, <laughs> developing a policy that requires review of all the policies, not just fair and impartial policing policies, but a review of all policies um, at least annually or something like that. Something like that. And I would also um, say that one of the things that should be used are the, um, the equity impact assessment tool that has been introduced by the executive director of yep. racial equity, that we would use that in a way to, to uh, structure and facilitate that review. Okay, I think that sounds reasonable and something that can be added. Yes, Senator Rom Hinsdale. 
I think I may ask this of, of several of the witnesses we have, um, but Aton, when you hear Office of Community Engagement and you think about the people who come to you with you know, grievances and concerns, do you feel like that title for that office, that sort of underlying spirit of what an Office of Community Engagement would do, would feel in any way like it adds the right value for them? that it speaks to what they're asking for? Honestly, no, I don't like the title. I don't know what I would like better, but I think it's a great improvement over community relations because that had a more, <laughs> we're getting there, I guess is what I'm saying. It's getting better and better. Every time everyone goes over this, it's getting better and better. Um, I don't, think this is quite it yet. It doesn't, um, it doesn't comprise the notion of complaint. It doesn't comprise the idea of review. And those are two things that we just earmarked right now as being very important. So I think that whatever title, Office of, ah, uh, I'm Oversight. stuck. <laughs> yeah oversight yeah, yeah it, it is more mm -hmm. like oversight yes um i like that better um for the love of all that is holy don't put it advisory everyone will no. freak out and start screaming and throwing things no <laughs> don't do that but but something more like oversight i think would be far more to the point yes thank you okay thank you um, I'm going to jump to, thank you. Um, I'll see you at breakfast. Yes, you will. <laughs> so Susanna. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Susanna Davis, racial equity director for the state. I actually can be extremely brief. I came in, um, actually it was a month ago today. January 28th and spoke mm -hmm. in support of the creation of an agency. I spoke mainly about the importance of consistency and uniformity in the way that people are treated across the state. If you are interacting with law enforcement in Bennington, Brattleboro, Barton, or Burlington, you should have some sense of what you can expect. And there should be some level of accountability that is uniform across the state. I also spoke about um, something similar to what co-director Nasred Longo said, which was that oftentimes I get contacted by people who are um, afraid or aggrieved or aren't sure how to proceed. And if we thought that the FIP co-directors grip on some of these agencies was tenuous, then racial equity offices is even more tenuous. The fact is that there's a lot that we can't do, and that is a, a major Point of disappointment and frustration for us because inequities don't know political boundaries, right? Injustice doesn't stop at the county line and say, well, sorry, it's outside of your jurisdiction, so it's no longer your concern. It's always our concern, especially if it's happening in the state. And so being able to create a, uni a more unified system means that racial equity office will be able to put more eyes on the work. It means that um, the state we'll be able to put more eyes on the work and that we can have greater consistency. Those are the things that I mentioned in the last testimony. I stand by those remarks. Also want to recall that that same day of testimony, we heard from Wilda White, who mm -hmm. made the important point regarding the Office of Community Engagement. Um, one of the points that she made, which I thought was very astute, was that community engagement should be happening throughout any agency or department, and it shouldn't be siloed in an office. And we feel the same exact way about racial equity, right? Or health equity or education reform or what have you. Um, so in thinking about that, I would say that AOA racial equity is, is ambivalent to the question of whether there should be an office of community engagement, but rather what we prioritize is that there is, that there are two things. Number one, an appropriate venue for members of the public to feel comfortable approaching the agency for any issue, whether it's fun stuff like, hey, let's play basketball with some police officers, if that's your thing, or for serious things like, hey, we want to have a serious discussion about community safety in our, in our community. 
So whether it's the more lighthearted or the more serious things, there should be a, a place where members of the public can go. And when I say members of the public, I'm very aware not to use terms like citizen because not everyone's a citizen and not everyone is a resident either. Right? Policing in Vermont goes beyond just the people who live here. So any member of the public should be able to approach us for any reason and we should also have a robust structure for handling complaints. And the reason that this is an important part of this is because if we're going to consolidate, that is necessarily going to reduce the number of pathways for people to bring complaints. We are going to be addressing complaints under a unified system, presumably, which means that people will have fewer options to do so. And that's why those fewer options need to be exceptional and effective and trustworthy. Now, in, pre in jurisdictions where I previously worked, we had entities like a CCRB, a Civilian Complaint Review Board. Um, there are lots of models around the country for different ways that complaints or concerns can be lodged. I am going to decline to propose any specifically here because there are lots of professionals on the line who could give detailed examples of what could work here. But I will say that when it comes to community engagement, I see it as two hemispheres. One is a complaint process, and two is the everything else process. And the everything else really should be happening throughout. That's something that I, I strongly agree with Wilda on. Um, and I think to, the, to Senator Rahm's question of what does community engagement mean to you, I, I couldn't help when you first asked the question of the previous witness, I couldn't help but to think of LA County, uh, LA County Police, which has a public relations team of I think 42, 42 people whose job it is to get on Twitter and say, what explosion? I didn't hear an explosion. What truck full of fireworks, right? That's not what we're looking for here in Vermont. No. Um, so, you know, community engagement, I think, can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but at its core, it has to satisfy the need of the community, not just our level of willingness. In other words, if community says we need A, B, C, D, it is not for us to say, we'll do B and C, but that's all we're willing to do. Uh, I think as long as we're satisfying the need and the community feels like we are accessible enough, that's when we'll know that we've done it accurately. And again, there are lots of models nationally that we could look to. I do um, have a lot of faith that if we do, if we do process equity right, then we can figure out a structure that is most effective for the people we're trying to reach. It's not just about the members of the public who already feel comfortable coming to us. It's about those who don't and why not and what can we change to get them in that place. So I, I have a couple of questions. Thank you so much. I, I guess um, my question is, and I, I don't care what the title is, but I think that under in the bill, under the explanation, it, it what it does is it calls for whatever this entity is to create this process we're not we we haven't tried to create it we're we're leaving that to the to the entities which i assume are going to be aton and you and will done and the commissioner and community representatives to create that that process and that structure so i'm con i'm a little bit confused about whether we um just get rid of it or if we expand it. And, and I also have some concern, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is where you were going, but when we talk about um, lodging complaints, I believe that the Community Justice, I mean, Criminal Justice Council oversees um, law enforcement and that they do have a, a process for lodging complaints. And, and I don't know if we want Maybe we want to have um, more than one place where complaints can be lodged against law enforcement or questions asked. But I, I think we need to be very careful that we don't um, set up a conflicting process with the Community Justice, Criminal Justice Council. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm glad that you said that because I didn't want to come away from my testimony and find that somehow the BCJC was um, ineffective or inadequate. I think that that is a fine um, and a fine and functioning process. And I do agree with something that you touched on, which is that we wanna make sure that there's a no wrong door approach 
um, that people who may not be aware of the BCJC mm -hmm. either have an easy way to get connected to it. Maybe that just means doing better um, publicity about it. Maybe that's all it takes. But if not, or if there is some other barrier or chilling effect that may be created, then we could consider perhaps, is there a side door that we could have for people? Um, again, I, what I don't wanna do is create more bureaucracy or disjointed parallel processes. However, on the topic of policing, on the topic of law enforcement, um, it is fragile and our, our relationship to the community is, is fragile. And so as a result, we, we may have to think about um, ways that are not just beneficial to us from a sort of governmental efficiency perspective, but also that are actually gonna uh, bring people forward. Okay, Madam Chair. So, yep. Yes, so I, I could be wrong as well, and maybe Commissioner Shirley could help shed some light, but as I understand it, you know, if there is a complaint against state police, that still would go to the Agency of Public Safety and CJC is investigating local law enforcement. So already there's challenges for people to know who they dealt with, where they're supposed to go, um, you know, who's in charge of what, what the process is, what information they need to keep on hand in the immediate aftermath. CJC, as I understand it too, it's very much a certification review that would be post dated in many ways. I don't know that it has to do with sort of immediate remedies for what occurred for somebody. And I do commend Commissioner Sherling because as I understand it, I believe in his own judgment as a leader, he has, as I understand it, started to share more, a little bit more information with people. If something happened, what happened, what, you know, if, if there was a finding of fault or misconduct, you know, generally what kinds of um, uh, infractions or punishments or what have you were levied against officers within the state police. I think that right now is a judgment call. I don't know that that's embedded anywhere. So depending on who the commissioner or secretary is, the practice of how transparent and what's shared and what internal findings look like and how the process unfolds still is not standardized. Um, so I just wanna, I may not have an, all of that fully correct, but I do think it is as to, uh, to the director's point, you know, there are a lot of wrong doors for people. I don't think they know automatically where to go and what information they need to have to get help if they feel like they need a remedy to a situation they experience. One of, one of the things that we could do is probably get out our, Sorry, one of the things that we could do is make sure we get our ethics bill passed so that there is that funnel that anybody can use for a complaint or a question about anybody, including law enforcement. I, I just wanna make, um, and I may misunderstand completely what, what people, where we are, but in my mind, this is far more than a complaint bureau. This, this office should not be seen just as a complaint bureau. This office is because the, the agency, whether it's emergency management or law enforcement or fire safety, should be engaging with the communities. And th I think that this office was intended to be that the office that set up the processes for that engagement and how it happens within the agency. That's, that was my understanding when um, Representative Colston wrote the, the language, that that was what his, that's how we looked at it. And engagement might be a really dumb name, but I, I'm not sure that I agree with oversight because it isn't really oversight. It's, it's how do we meet the, the needs of our community, whatever they are. I, I have, I put some iterations on paper and one is the Office of Community Standards and Safety from what I heard from the first two folks and I'd love to hear additional testimony. I I'd really, I guess where I am is talking about, and I, and I, I agree, Madam Chairman, Chief Pete can attest, you know, when we did work with, the Mont, with Montpelier on community safety, 
it was everything from, you know, I want to see them on bikes and back on foot again to, so I know that they're in my community and I can interact with them, you know, to, I don't like that there's people with guns, you know, in my neighborhood. So it is a huge yeah. range of what people want to say from, I want to talk to them more <laughs> and, and experience, you know, them as a friend, as officer friendly to like, this isn't working for me. So, um, yeah. I think either we use a name that is broader and captures more of that engagement can be really triggering for people who've been impacted by the police, or we leave it unnamed and talk about that range that Susanna mentioned from, you know, the basketball game to the horrific experience that they want some remedy for. I, I'm going to jump out Senator Clarkson here in a minute, but I just want to make sure that we're not talking about just law enforcement here. We are talking about an agency of public safety that is far more than law enforcement. And the, the um, Department of Emergency Management should have the same kind of, so it isn't just going out and saying, what do you want your police to be? Right, it's, and to Susanna's point, that should be woven throughout. I've talked to Erica Borneman about ensuring that emergency communications are in other languages and things that they yeah. need to okay. be thinking about before uh, someone complains to some department. So it should be okay. throughout. I'm not saying it, it isn't. And I think fire safety, frankly, does a pretty good job trying to get, be proactive and explaining to people why they need to care about fire safety. But I think this is an area where people are, are, are certain that, you know, engagement isn't necessarily what they're looking for. Okay. Senator Clarkson. Thanks. I I'd like to go back to to uh, Zuzana's referencing of Wilda's testimony because I also heard Wilda saying um, uh, all these things, but also that this uh, hopefully that this office, whatever we name it, would be um, sort of a guiding compass for other depart departments in the agency of and reviewing how they do their work and uh, helping each one of those departments do a better job in terms of the, through the lens of, of the values that, that, that we're espousing here. So for me, what Wilda said, it, it, to me, this office just in, would be also ensuring that that lens is applied to the work in all these departments. And that, that so there'd be this element of uh, just uh, uh, review and, in, and and constant improvement on on how we interact, uh, how we do business. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yes, Senator Colomar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've been giving this a little bit of thought too since we began looking at this one section in the bill. I don't know whether this and and I was intrigued by Senator Ron Hensdale's, um recently suggested name. I don't know whether this would work or not. It's just, I'm throwing it out on the table and trying to add to the discussion, if you will. How about the Office of Community Collaboration or even better, in my view, the Office of Community Empowerment? Um, mm -hmm. Because I think there's an element in that second piece that allows for, and I understand where Senator Ron Hinsdale is coming from in terms of accountability, but if you say accountability to most people, I think they assume that you mean, ah, I gotcha. You're not, you're, you're doing something wrong and I gotcha. And I don't know that that is always gonna be the case. I would like to see this much like we talked about with the ethics bill as the office that is a portal for allowing people to have a whole bunch of input into how they, see their community. So those are just my thoughts. I think empowerment is a great uh, improvement. Here, here. I like empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'd love to hear the thoughts of others, but I really appreciate that, Senator Colomar. I really, I do think for many people, the opposite of engagement is empowerment. Um, so I really, just really appreciate you raising that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Susanna, thank you. Um, and Please stick around unless you had something more you wanted to say now. I do just have one more thing on the last sure. point that we mentioned. Um, I was also very inspired by Senator Ron Hinsdale and Senator Colin Moore's um, suggestions for a possible name. But I just want to say that whatever we land on, we have to do it. 
we have to do the thing that we call it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. So right. I'm going to ask as we're going through these, if if um, I've made a couple notes here of things that would be added to the responsibilities. Um, and as, as we go through this, if people have uh, suggestions for things to be added, like Eitan recommended the, the re ongoing review of policies, um, setting up a structure for that and um, setting up a structure for embedding this into all the departments and offices in the agency. So I've got those two kind of things um, on my list. And if other people keep a list and then we can have Amarin um, uh, see what we think about those. Does that make sense to everybody so that we can kind of keep this? Um, okay, great. So I'm gonna go to Kaya, well, let's see. Do, oh, there, there you are, I see you. So Kaya Morris, would you like to join us? And I also see that Dan Fingus is with us. Um, he, I don't have him on the list, but I see he's also here. So Kaya. Hello, good afternoon, um, everyone. So for the record, my name is Kaya Morris. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the executive director for Rights and Democracy. Um, I am joined oh, here today. Sorry, can we just pause and celebrate that you have a new <laughs> role? You have been elevated to executive director of Rights and Democracy. Congrats. This is exciting, Kaya. When did, when did this happen? <laughs> it began this week. So we are capping off the week with a bang for sure. It started off with a bang and it's finishing off with fireworks. So, so glad to be able to be here and as well to welcome Dan Fingus, who is now in my previous role as the Movement Politics Director and will be helping to support um, our advocacy here in the State House. So um, I don't have a ton to offer. I'm thinking and you know, I'm, I'm listening and I'm processing through um, so much of what's been said. Um, I think going back to um, what Dr. Davis was saying around thinking of how we don't have measures of accountability, I'd love to see more clarity around that because um, as we are looking at communities to create mechanisms for holding public safety accountable, there still needs to be one more level for people to almost have an appeals process, so to speak, somewhere else to go. So I appreciate the no wrong door approach of wanting to find that. I'm a little confused as well as to what the relationship between this and OPR is, but um, I just, I'm just because I'm new to this conversation, so I'm not sure if this is meant to enhance the work of OPR, take some of their load off, but they also have a, that that's part of their function within state government is to look at some of those pieces. Um, I can tell you um, with regards to the questions earlier around the Criminal Justice Training Council and dealing with local law enforcement versus state police with regards to complaints, that, that system is, um, it's non-functioning. It is completely non-functioning. I can tell you from personal experience that we filed a complaint in December of 2019 that has never been pursued, period, at all. So if that is meant to be a mechanism for people to utilize um, communicating concerns and having them be investigated in a meaningful way, that's not a functioning system. So what is positive about the three folks that you have there is that you're trying to increase capacity. So those are just my some kind of high level views. I'm happy to, I'll be here on the call <laughs> to respond if there's any other, other direct questions, but I am more than excited to introduce you to Dan Fingus and to pass the mic as he can give a better and a broader statement from Rights and Democracy with regards to this particular bill. Thank you, Kaya, and congratulations. So, Dan. Great. Thank you, Chair White, members of the Senate Gov Government Operations Committee. Um, I am Dan Fingus, Vermont Movement Politics Director for Rights and Democracy. I have been with Rights and Democracy for the past three years in a different role, so I'm not new to the organization. and just trying to fill some very big shoes that Kaya is leaving behind. Um, while uh, we're here to discuss S-155 and S-250 specifically, I wanted to start by talking briefly about the things that RAD considers when we consider legislation that concerns criminal justice, law enforcement, and how we design those systems. We all know there's an enduring issue of police violence across the nation, disproportionately impacting communities of color, those experiencing poverty, and individuals in mental health crisis. A just and transparent criminal justice system is a crucial part of building an inclusive and equitable Vermont. Accountability and transparency needs to lead to true justice. All Vermonters need to know that if they are treated as subhuman, are assaulted, are degraded, or have a loved one die at the hands of someone employed in law enforcement, 
there will be accountability. All Vermonters need to know that those in power in law enforcement are, departments and agencies see their jobs as public safety and serving the public and not in service of their officers and employees. So with all that said, when it comes to S-155 um, and specifically Section 6084, which calls for the creation of the Office of Community Engagement, we feel that a more robust and systemic approach to interacting with and listening to the community's needs is an excellent idea. We believe that an Office of Community Accountability would be a better option. It is no longer acceptable to just get community feedback and have community engagement that would look like more coffee with cops and other such superficial events and programs. These serve much more as photo ops and spaces that are only accessible to those who are comfortable engaging directly with local police and other public safety officials. Real community accountability means not just mechanisms for engagement and feedback, which the current language calls for, but actual mandates and mechanisms that turn feedback into system change. Like Director Davis said, we must not just choose and mandate a couple of activities, as currently there is nothing in this bill that requires the Office of Public Safety that to do more than get feedback and keep a list of stakeholders. We need a stronger vision for how state agencies interact with and are responsive to the community, especially those who have historically been ignored. Um, and just lastly, as we consider stakeholder, the stakeholder piece of this office, we must also create systems that compensate stakeholders for their time in order to eliminate the imbalance of paid agency staff interacting with uncompensated community members, which puts further pressure and stress on our community leaders most impacted by the current law enforcement system. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to um, ask you if you, um, how you would, because I, I, I understand. I think that you're right here that we the the way it's currently written, it creates um, a structure for uh, community engagement, empowerment, accountability, whatever we call it. But it doesn't then uh, translate that into the actions for, the, for, cha for systemic changes. And I wonder if you have um, some language that we could put in there that would then say, okay, now we've created these systems to, to get to work with the community how do we now ensure that those um, get those uh, changes are are made? Uh, do you, do you have any suggested language for that? I'm I'm not sure. I'm not putting this very well, but I yeah. think that that is important. Well, I mean, I think like um, Mr. Nasred and Longo said earlier, I think the the consistent or annual review of policies. I think having something written that. The, that what is coming through this office is actually considered in that review. Um, I also, it's a little glaring that it doesn't really explain like this office and the folks running it, what their role within the rest of the agency is and how the work that they're doing can actually drive the agency and not just be kind of the public face of the agency. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like thinking about how this piece of the agency has is empowered to to actually like push the change internally within the agency um, and move, move the bureaucracy. I think that's, that's really crucial. And again, um, when we think of stakeholders, especially if we're compensating stakeholders, having as many folks who are real stakeholders involved in this process in a way that's meaningful and not just advisory could really make some changes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure how we, that we can get as detailed as saying who we pay and who we don't pay, but I think that we can say that there needs to be meaningful accommodations made for people to be able to provide meaningful input. And if, I think we, I mean, we can put this in here. I don't know that we can go any farther in terms of saying who should be paid and who shouldn't, but I think we can put in here that there needs to be some um, avenue so that people can have meaningful input. And that I was trying to get at that at your statement about the um, by saying something about embedding the it into the all the departments and stuff, but that wasn't very um, very well very articulate. So I think that hopefully um, our really amazing um, people that work on our bills can. Uh, craft this into good language, but 
Thank you. If you think of anything while you're listening, um, please. Uh, I usually don't look at my emails while we're doing this, but if you have some language that you can think of, email it to me and I'll make sure that Amarin, that we talk about it and, okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations on your new job. Thank you. Elevation. Well, he, he might think better about that when he has to start dealing more yeah. with us. <laughs> okay, has uh, Stefan hasn't joined us yet, but Falco is here. Falco, would you like to join us? Good afternoon, uh, Falco Schilling. I'm the advocacy director for the ACLU of Vermont. And thank you so much for having me this afternoon. I believe this is my first time having the opportunity to testify to the committee and I'm happy to speak, um, focus in on the Office of Community Engagement section of this bill. But generally, you know, we have no major concerns with the bill as, as, as a whole. Um, and in terms of looking at the Office of Community Engagement, I think would echo a number of the things that other witnesses have said up until this point. Um, uh, Dr. Nesra and Longo made an excellent point that one of the, the focuses of this work should be an iterative review of processes um, within uh, the agency and making sure that those are meeting community needs. Um, I also understand the idea that we might not wanna to be too prescriptive of what exactly this office would be doing before we actually create this office. Um, putting too much of that in statute right now without asking people to you know, do the actual work and think about it um, is something where one thing that I think might be valuable is creating report backs at least on how this work has gone since the office has been instituted, um, at least you know, initially to see how that work has been happening. Mm -hmm. But I think on an ongoing basis, because I think that is the one thing that, that seems to be missing here is there's a, a charge to do this work and to engage the community it just says, go do it. We don't know how that work is happening. Um, and I think that's, that's information that should be reported back to the stakeholders who are going to be engaged as well as you know, the legislature who is doing this oversight role. Because I could see you know, getting this office off the ground, uh, beginning that work and then bringing reports back to you on how it's going. And then maybe that's when it's the time for the legislature to be more prescriptive of exactly what this role or this office should be doing you know, getting down to who should be on, who's getting paid to be on an advisory panel, things like that, or not advisory panel. I, I take Dr. Netzrad and Longo's yeah, right. um, criticism of that language uh, to heart. But I think the report back feature and creating that, that feedback loop is really important for meaningful um, engagement. So that's something that I think we would be looking for. Um, I, there was some suggestions that maybe this might go in a direction of more of a citizen oversight board or citizen review board. Um, I think that is a larger departure. That's something that we could be supportive of and be happy to provide language around and ideas around positive models if that's where the committee is going. Um, but initially looking at this bill and trying to um, create a mechanism so there is engagement across the spectrum of public safety. Um, I think one, making sure that there's more information provided on how that's happening with regular iterative reviews of policies and also the chance to review the work of this office from both the legislature and community perspectives would be things that are important and should be considered. And then as to the name of this office, um, I really, really appreciate the, the, the comment that whatever we name it, we actually have to do it. Um, I love the idea of an office of community empowerment, but in some ways calling an office that, which is not accomplishing those goals, um, can feel almost worse than not <laughs> doing it in the first place. So, you know, we don't want to call an office of empowerment if it's not actually empowering people. If it's really an office of engagement and that's what's happening, um, having an accurate name, I think, is important. Um, but if we are going more into the, the areas of accountability or oversight, that seems like a larger diversion from this bill, but something we'd be a conversation we'd be happy to engage in. So those are my brief comments on this bill up to this point. So I'm going to comment on your, um, res just to respond to your comment about the oversight that is not the intent of this office at all. And I think that we're looking at oversight in other avenues, but this really is a reorganization bill. That's, that really is all this is, is, a, is taking a department and making it into an agency. And we are putting this in here because we heard that, that the department or the agency needs to have have something like this, whatever it is called and however it is structured. So I appreciate your comments about um, 
not being too prescriptive here, but letting the letting it um, be created and then reporting back. And maybe that's when we become more prescriptive if if we feel that it isn't um, actually doing what we had hoped it would do. So thank you, Falco. Allison, you had. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think that the idea of a report back is really important uh, because uh, we need to see how we're doing and what this office's impact is on the rest of the agency, how it's improving engagement in every department. Uh, and um, so, and how it's uh, empowering community engagement. So I, I, I think that's a great idea. And uh, maybe if we gave it two years to get it set up, I, I, I think it's going to take a while, but I think two years would, or, oh, I see the chair wants to see it sooner. Um, mm. But I, I definitely think uh, that that's great. So thanks. I, I think we could have a report back on how the setup is going. They yeah. may not have results yet, but I think that we should definitely have a report back in a year of how, how it's being set up and what the, the, um, where they are. So Senator Rom Hinsdale. I guess I just want to say that one of the things that's starting to trouble me is that oversight is being framed in a potentially negative light as the idea that there's, you know, some form of punishment already when a complaint system already exists, where right now we've been talking for years about data collection and analysis and ensuring that we're moving in somewhat of a of a streamlined direction toward improving some pretty deep racial disparities. And so, you know, a law enforcement that wants to have its own oversight and its own ability to track whether it's improving or not improving in terms of those measures is not necessarily some kind of external force, you know, telling them that they're not doing a good job. It's a way to have internal oversight over some pretty critical goals to improving public safety in the state. And two, I also, I worry that engagement is seen as potentially a neutral idea, that engagement you know, is generally gonna be neutral to positive, but for many people, particularly people of color, we've seen engagement offices put out media relations pieces that say George Floyd's murder was a medical incident, you know, or obfuscate, information that that came from the Minneapolis Police Department, Allison, you looked confused. Um, but you know, there have been relations and engagement offices that have served to obfuscate um, what has happened in a situation from the perspective of the community. So I just don't want to get us in a place where we think oversight is some kind of negative attack on law enforcement and in engagement is some kind of neutral tool that law enforcement has available to them. I appreciate that. I do think that oversight is, as Julio has reminded us, there are many, many, many different um, models of oversight committees. And I don't, we are not, we're not going there in this bill. This isn't a bill to provide an oversight committee for the agency of public safety. It's, um, I mean, we at some point we might get to that, but over this is for the entire, the entire um, agency, not just law enforcement. And I think we have to. I I keep going back, and I know that Erica said that they're they're doing fine, and we reorganized them last year, and um, they they do do fine, but they still need to have community engagement. I I can't think of a, a another word. Um, for it, and if somebody else, I guess Falco <laughs> said maybe empowerment was a bit too aspirational, and if we used that and didn't really get there, that might be more of a disappointment than anything. I thought it was a great idea, and but so um, Falco, did you have anything else? I do appreciate the. The idea, though, of not getting too specific on what it should be doing and how it should be doing, but um, having it 
I, I do say that it should they should come back in. Um, I, I don't know how long it takes to to set this up. Um, come back in um, March of next year with a report. Yeah, all I would add is I just reinforcing the idea that if we're asking people to give their time and energy as stakeholders to engage um, with the agency, we want to make sure that that feedback is, is listened to right. and, and taken seriously and incorporated. And I think that is one of the, you know, the iterative feedback process is what's going to be most important, making sure that um, this engagement is meaningful and has a positive impact. Um, so that, I think that's all I would add uh, for now. And the, the way to do that is to report back, to report back to the stakeholders and to report back to the General Assembly. I think that that's at least one way to, to start getting at it and we'll see if that's adequate. Yeah. All right. Um, any, um, because I do not see Stefan yet. Um, no. yeah. yeah, I told him he might, you know, weigh in later in the afternoon on the policing bill. He was just running late um, on the on S-250. He, he knows he might miss this discussion. Okay. All right, thank you. So um, would anybody else like to offer any comments on the bill in general or this particular section? Um, has anybody come up with brilliant ideas as we've been listening? Um, yes. <laughs> Just Julia, I wanna say something. I, I, um, I, I'm, I'm either at a, let's not try to name it so we don't give it an overly lofty title. We also don't give it a title that's triggering and kind of has the opposite effect of what we want. Or my latest is the Office of Community Resourcing and Empowerment. Okay, I'm, I've got a whole list of them here now. <laughs> I keep editing one so that I don't just have the whole list. You know, I maybe we should name it the Office of XXX and um, ask them to come to work with the stakeholders to come up with a name. I, I'm not sure you can do that, but the, the blank part I agree with. I don't know if there's silence because XXS has like kind of a different meaning than completely blank slate, but um, yes, I think being open to an untitled office. And I, and I don't know if we can do that in lead, when we draft legislation or not, but I, I really don't care as much about the title as I do about what it's going to be doing and yeah. how it's going to be. I, I, I would agree. And we can, the nice thing about legislation is we can change it. I mean, we can change that title uh, as can the, it, it doesn't need legislation to change it. Uh, the, right. Yeah, would hope the secretary could do that with the people involved. So, so um, I see Julio has his hand up. Hi, yes, Julio Thompson, uh, Attorney General's Office, uh, Civil Rights Unit. So uh, the committee asked uh, our office to appear. Um, the background I bring here is is less from my experience in our Civil Rights Unit, more my professional experience dealing with police reform in a number of jurisdictions and working on uh, a, a number of pattern and practice investigations with the Department of Justice and a number of consent decrees work that I'm still doing. Um, I, I just want to offer, uh, and I don't have a view about the title. Um, I do, I do want to offer a little bit of uh, context for these kinds of functions in other law enforcement agencies and, and point out some functions that they serve or have served in other parts of the country that haven't been mentioned today and then draw to the committee's attention an area of focus for this legislation where we might, where the committee might want to get more detail about how the Office of Community Engagement, placeholder name, functions vis-a-vis -vis the Department of Law Enforcement. Because right now, um, the, the, this bill doesn't house that office within the department, it's outside of the department. Uh, and, and that, there's pros and cons to that, but I think there, there should be testimony elicited on what the interaction and access one office has 
to the department. Um, the historic background is that since the late 1950s, thousands of police departments have assigned officers to serve in some sort of community liaison program uh, for much uh, and we're talking, you know, there's over 18,000 agencies in the country. So not to single anyone out, but for many of those, history has shown and there's stacks of research and scholarship on this. For many cases, those are used basically to create a buffer zone between the operational side of law enforcement and the community um, where it provides political cover, it may limit liability, uh, it may ease community tensions or at least um, provide protection for the elected officials in the department. But it wasn't really intimately involved in actually being a co-partner in public safety, which is the much more modern view. Um, some, the phrasing, if you do the research now, you'll hear phrases not like community-oriented policing uh, or problem-based po policing, but community-driven policing, where the model is that the community is a partner, not someone to be consulted with, not someone to have a meeting with periodically, um, as, as something of a courtesy where the department has already made its decision. And then it's a check-in with the community. It's, it's, it's a very different approach that's being used now. Um, and, uh, and there are different roles of community uh, partnering that haven't been mentioned. Uh, it's not just fair and impartial policing and that just doesn't mean to diminish it. I mean, only fair and impartial policing, but it, 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 it ranges from things like identifying what the, what the public health and public safety priorities are. Uh, and does, do the officials who are tasked with it, with engaging or whatever the word you wanna use with the committee, do they have access to, or, or a say in um, deployment of resources? Do they have, will they be listened to in terms of deciding where to put cars and people uh, or where not to put cars and people uh, or policy training is there, uh, are they involved in policies or training related to uh, language access, to ADA accommodation, uh, to dealing to their crisis intervention program, uh, to peer intervention programs? Um, are they involved in, uh, do they have any uh, interaction with the agency's internal complaint process? So for example, some police departments have their internal affairs or the equivalent do audits of their complaint policy process by running stings. They make false complaint, you know, they make up a complaint, they phone it in, and then they follow that complaint with throughout the system to determine whether officers and supervisors are actually reporting, logging, and investigating complaints. Do they have any audit? Do they have any involvement there? Um, uh, some modern forms of, you know, again, community. Um, driven or community concerned uh, operations includes, not, not from a punitive standpoint, but just more of an informational standpoint, randomly audit, auditing body-worn camera footage. So they can see firsthand how officers are engaging with the public in certain communities. Not again, not necessarily looking for trouble and, and to uh, discipline them, but maybe to get a, get a sense of what the departments and what the community's temperature are. Um, and, uh, you know, I, especially with policy the, it, development, the history generally is that the department tasks a few specialists to write or collect policies from other agents. They write the policy, they're happy with it, and then they send it out to the community, usually in an abbreviated time period, uh, for the community to comment um, with little introduction or very few opportunities for consultation. But the more modern approach of policing for some policies is where there's a real need is to go to the community first. So for example, and this is the last example I'll just offer and then I'll, I'll, I'll take any questions if there are any. In 2018, for example, the San Francisco County Sheriff, uh, Vicki Hennessy was the first woman elected um, sheriff for that county, uh, uh, knew that they were having diff difficult interactions with the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, uh, it's about 1% of their contacts, but a very highly vulnerable community. Uh, and so they, they needed to have policies and training related to how deputies addressed people, how they checked their identification, how they searched them, and how they arrested and housed them safely. 
and so in order to do that, rather than going to other police departments and collecting their policies and then writing it and then sending it to the community, they went to the community first. They went to the transgender advocacy community. Uh, they uh, went to the local human rights commission and different groups and asked them to outline the policies that they need and then work from the community into the department rather than the department into the community. So I know this legislation isn't going to dictate what that office does, I get that. But I do, when I do see a structure, and that's what the bill mostly is, is arranging structures. I do ask and, and would like to hear testimony on the fact that you have a deputy um, secretary who runs that office, but that office is not within the Department of Law Enforcement. What, how that affects access, for example, community, you know, community partnership can be very operationally significant. For example, if there are planned demonstrations, as we saw over the last few summers where people are going to engage in First Amendment group demonstrations, uh, knowing and, and having communications with the community and then feeding that into the people who have to provide um, uh, you know, public safety and that includes medical uh, services on standby in case people need me medical assistance. Um, that's very operationally significant. Uh, and, um, and, and so one would hope that that office would have that kind of direct access so they could talk about, so that they would have access to operational planning because if it's, if, if it is structurally separate, so it's like, well, your office, we're, this is police tactics and operations and your community, community communications, then there may be a missed opportunity to actually make for safer uh, crowd management um, and, uh, and, and event management because, because of, that, of that silo. So that would be an area where I think we would wanna hear testimony. I, thank you. I think that we, um, and I think that we need to, one of the charges in there in the development of this structure is to make sure that there's um, the, it is defined how they're going to relate to the other departments, but we don't want it in the Department of Law Enforcement because this is not a law enforcement um, committee uh, office. This is for the entire Department of Public Safety. And we keep forgetting that, I mean, public safety and fire safety training services under here, the, we just taught, put in a whole study on animal cruelty issues and how they're gonna oversee that. Um, emergency management, the office of training is part of, it, there's an office of training here. There's the grant management uh, in the support services, there's grant management. Maybe, maybe when um, there's going to be, they need to have some community engagement or community input into how they manage their grants or how they award their grants. So this is not a law enforcement office. And I think we need to continue to remember that. Madam Chair, my point was very different, which was not, I wasn't, and our office doesn't take a position on whether it should be in or out. My point was to draw testimony on the question of access and participation and contribution to the department. Because right now it yeah. is housed within a department and within the department, people like Aton or who work on FIP issues have access to information that might otherwise be non-public by virtue of the fact that they were, are within the department. And so if you pull that function out, which offers certainly more flexibility for non-law enforcement functions and maybe a level, an additional level of independence. But the question for testimony is whether being outside of the structure affects access to, law, to information that is within the department uh, and, or impairs or limits contributing the information that that office develops from the community to feed it into the department or the other, dif or the other departments. Because that's not state, the access issue is not stated in the legislation. And so that, that could be a cost, that could be a loss because again, historically uh, community Organs of police departments are often quite siloed to rest from the rest of the operation. Uh, you know, I remember one 
uh, retired captain calling it, you know, that that's the uh, lollipops and ice packs bureau where they go out and they hand out baseball cards and they get in the newspaper and they hand out, you know, metaphorically hand out ice packs to the community who's offended by the operational side, but they're kind of isolated. Um, and so we, I, I don't think that that's the vision here. And so the question is what kind of access would that office have to department, department operational um, aspects? Well, I think that, that I think that's what, um, um, uh, now his name just uh, Dan was referring to when he talked about how is this office going to engage? What is the relationship with the rest of the agency, whether it's law enforcement or animal safety or um, emergency management? And I think that we can put something in there that instructs the in the creation of it that there need, it needs to be they need to define a structure that will uh, make sure that the this office has access and and um i want to say influence but and i'm not sure the right words but i think we can put that in there i don't think we want to put in how it's going to operate but we can put in that in the in the creation of it they need to address that yeah, and that was my only intent with the testimony was to isolate, was to isolate that that issue as something to I, I you know to elicit more testimony not just from me but from other folks about that. But those structures can create you know leadership silos and information silos that it, it may be maybe contrary to the original conception of the that was all. So yeah, and I don't think we want that. So we're gonna try and get some language around how to how to make sure that that doesn't happen. Anybody no else? Comment. Oh, thank you, Julio. I'm sorry. Sure. Anybody else have a comment on this um, section? I don't. Um, has Amarin left us? She hasn't been here for a while. Oh, I see that. She's um, double booked, Madam Chair. Oh. Okay, so um, committee, um, does anybody else want to weigh in on this right now? And then what I'm going to do is send some notes to Amron and see if perhaps she can um, come up with some language and help me committee here um, understand. So we're going to put the Office of Community. I mean, I don't, we probably should put a title in there or we're going to be, um, it's going to be too confusing for people, but so we need to have a title. How about engagement and empowerment for the moment or, or you know, and, and then we can, you know, we're not okay. voting it out this afternoon, are we? I had hoped we would. Uh, we have, okay. we have a lot of stuff that we have to do yeah, next week no, and we're I, only going to. Absolutely Again. have two days. And and I think when we get the report back in next March, we can we can get that could be one of the charges is maybe renaming, you know, coming up with the appropriate name after it's been worked on for a year uh, or nine months by that time. Um, but we can also have the house rename it. Yeah, yes, after exactly. after they have more thought and the um, um yeah. So so I, I really, first of all, I just want to say I really appreciated what Julio said, because for me, it really underscored the, the deep concern I'm having with the idea of saying engagement at all. I do think it becomes um, a buffer and something that can feel weaponized against people who want to get at operational change. So I just, I'm really appreciating that. Um, I'm going back to two words that Senator Collimore used, the Office of Community Collaboration and Empowerment. And I feel like that, you know, those, that's a good way to start out. And, you know, I think collaboration is where, yes, there are, there are, I want to acknowledge people that probably have had the privilege of never feeling unsafe around the police, but do want to create that experience for others of building an early sense of feeling safe around the police. And I think that's admirable, um, you know, to some extent. And then I think empowerment gets at, 
people otherwise feeling really defeated when they're looking for help and support to improve their community safety experience to um, get answers or, you know, a path forward for a remedy for something that happened to them. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. And then, so let me uh, get the list here of what we would like to put back in there. Oh, and there's Amarin. Goodness. Um, so did you get that title change? I stepped in right as you were finishing. So I, I just heard that there might be a change to a name of something. <laughs> well, we're going to, we were going to call it the um, office of blank, but um, collaboration and empowerment. Community collaboration. And community. Empowerment. Yeah, yeah. Community of collaborate. Yeah. Community is there. Okay. And then um, committee, the, what the notes I've made here, we want it, we want them to develop a structure for reviewing um, policies, uh, hopefully annual, uh, a structure for review and timing for reviewing all policies using, is it E-I-A-T? What is, what are those um, letters? Equity, Equity and inclusion. I don't well, know. That's, well, that's why I'm asking Susanna. Yeah. What What are those letters? Or maybe it was Falco that, oh, no, Susanna, there you are. We can't hear you, though. Sorry, Madam Chair, could you repeat the question? Which letters? Well, it's... um. We're, we're asking them to set up a structure for reviewing policies. And um, I don't know if it was you oh. or Falco, I think maybe it was Falco that said um, in this review, they should use the equity and inclusion action. That's where. Was, yeah, that was Dr. Nasred and Longo. It's the oh. equity impact assessment tool or EIA. And I've just chatted it to Gail okay. as well. Okay, great. Thank you. That, that I forgot who it was that said it, and I forgot what the letters were. I got the first ones. I got EIA, but I added a T on the end for some reason. Okay. So that's one thing we want to put in there. The other thing we want to put in there is um, defining the relationship to all the other departments and offices in the um, in, in the um, agency. And the other is um, making sure, uh, defi defining a system that um, is, um, allows for meaningful participation I, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, we're not going to say you should pay people or not pay people, but they need to define a structure for allowing meaningful participation. Is that? I mean, can we say meaningful participation and compensation? No, I don't want to say compensation. I think that's for them to decide what meaningful com um, because some, some, in some instances, it may be compensated and in some not. So I don't think we should be that definitive. I, I don't think. I don't know how other community members think. What about resources? What do you mean? Well, finding, I don't know, because then you're on the same path. Never mind. I was yeah, going to say finding want... necessary resources. But, but they may not need any necessary resources. Okay. I mean, we want them to define the structure of how they would allow meaningful participation. In some instances, that may be paying them. In some, some instances, it may be providing childcare. In some instances, it may be um, providing transportation. But they, they need to come up with a structure to allow yeah. meaningful participation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the third... The, Madam Chair. Yes. Hey. I would just say you're you're right. They need to define the resources they need going forward. I mean, I, yeah. I don't think we need to put that in there. No, I agree. I think this is part okay. of the world. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the other thing.
thing that we want in there is um, to um, report back yep. in a year on the um, the progress that they've made toward um, the restructuring, the report back to the stakeholders and to the General Assembly, and then um, for the next three years, we want them to report back annually their um, their progress in their progress. Yep. And what, how, how they, yeah. Amran, you look for the question. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I believe there is already a report back requirement for November, 2023. No, this is different. This oh, is just for the is, office. Of oh, we're still all in the, okay. Sorry. This is all in the office of community oh, engagement no. or community um, collaboration and empowerment. Okay. This is all under there. I see, okay. Yeah. Uh, all of these, um, I think we added three or four bullet points and four, four. and um, and the, yeah. So is any of the current subdivisions one through three on page 11 changing? We, or is this all in addition to what is currently is in the draft? This all in addition to the, uh, the bullets under the um, community engagement, what is currently called okay. community engagement, yeah. Okay. So I have the name change. Um, mm -hmm. I need maybe just a reiteration of sure. having caught part of the name of this, the equity impact assessment something. What? <laughs> what was the oh, name of the... Tool. Eight, tool. Okay. Oh, I, I did get T in there, right? Did I have Equity the rest of that? Impact assessment tool. Yes. Assessment tool. Okay. And what is? I'm, I apologize. No, no, no. What? <laughs> I wish I had been here for part of this conversation. Um, and what is it that you would like the office to be doing with this tool? We want them to review, set up a structure to review all policies periodically, and we won't say annually, we should say periodically and um, using, and part of their review will be using that tool okay. for reviewing policies. When they review the policies, they need to incorporate that tool into their review. Did they get that right? Yep. And um, the section about defining the relationship between the offices within the agency, what do you mean by that? With the relationship between the this office and okay. the other um, departments and offices in the agency. Was that right, committee? I believe so. We're not going to tell them what the relationship should be, but they need to be able to it's, it's, um, define what that is so that yep. it doesn't just become a little silo sitting over there. Okay. And the next was um, to create a structure that allows for meaningful participation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Me, I Do you guess want to specify with meaning, who? Meaning, <laughs> meaningful community participation. We don't want to use citizens and we don't want to use residents. Yep. Community participation. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then, okay. And so I will make a separate subsection for the reporting requirement. Oh, okay. It'll just be easier. <clears throat> oh, 
Although if they're really doing it right, they shouldn't have to report to the stakeholders because they're involved all along, but we will put that in there anyway. I was gonna say, so for a report requirement, um, there is a, so I should add, um, so do you want a report in one year roughly and then every three years after that? Every that two, right? make it every two years to start with and then we can, does that make any sense? Uh, two or three. But I think that we should have some consistency in reports for at least a couple of years. Yeah, yep. absolutely. And who is the report going to? What? Well, it'll go to the general assembly. No, uh, have Mark. it go to um, HGO, SGO, and House and Senate judiciaries. Just even though they're not involved in it, but I think it would be good for them to see it. And then I don't know how we um, identify it going to the stakeholders. And that was Falco had suggested that, but I don't know how we, maybe a publicly, um, I, I don't know, how would you word that Falco, if you're there? Uh, Falco Schilling, for the record, I, I mean, it might not necessarily be necessary to name these stakeholders, but you could, you know, they are charged with identifying a list of stakeholders in the bill. And so it oh. could be a report to the identified stakeholders, because that's one oh. of the duties um, given to them under that section. Perfect. Perfect. Because it, it could would be a public but it report, but it would specifically go to that list of stakeholders and the general yep. assembly. Yeah, because the report would be Perfect. public to the General Assembly, but if they're identifying a list of stakeholders, then they yep. should at least be informing them of, of the work. Perfect. Okay. Okay. I Got think it? I think I have this all of the substance down. Are you looking to vote on this bill today? I would love to if we can. What okay. I think we might do is, um, I don't know that we're going to take some testimony on three sections of 250. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, I don't know how far we'll get with that. And we also have this on the list for next week, uh, not next week, but the week we come back, I've put the, uh, some stat, substantial time for 250 to make sure we get through the whole thing. And, um, so if, if we took like a committee, do you need a break? Yes. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break, come back. We'll dive into 250.